All right, very good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, please welcome today our wonderful lecturer, Courtney Baker. Courtney uh, works here at Grady on 7A. She's the clinical leader, the clinical director, and she's going to share with you all her knowledge about CCRN Neuro Review. Good morning. So the first thing we're going to start out with is a little anatomy review, our, our agenda. So this is just everything that we're going to go over. Um, for today. Uh, I know some of you guys are online, so just let me know if you have some questions. Don't hesitate to stop me um, in the middle of anything. So anatomy, lobes of the brain. This is great to know because if your patient has a stroke or any kind of bleed in these kind of areas, you'll know what um, signs and symptoms they'll exhibit. For example, a lot of times with your frontal lobe, you're going to be very impulsive, that's your judgment, your reasoning, um, or if you have one in your cerebellum, it's going to be your motor and your coordination. So it's always good to know what the lobes of the brain do, what they're responsible for. So when you have a deficit in that area, you'll know what um, symptoms to look for and what will be effective. So your cranial nerves, you have 12 cranial nerves. There's a lot of cute little um, acronyms out there to help you remember it. Uh, the main ones that we kind of do when we um, do our neuro assessment is our ocular motor. So that's when you're checking your pupil assessment and then facial movement as well, which is number seven. Ocular is three, uh, facial is seven. And then circle of Willis is all of the um, blood flow in your brain. Um, it is great for especially diverting whenever you have an event to kind of help collateral circulation around that event to help make sure that your brain is continued to perfuse. And then your spinal cord. So um, just keep your vertebrae, keep your spinal cord um, protected. You have your cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, sacrum, and coccyx. So just a good supportive way to make sure your spinal cord stays intact and stays protected. So we'll start off with some brain facts. So the brain requires a constant supply of oxygen and glucose. Um, it also requires pressure. So if you have, the way that we um, measure pressure is our CPP, which is our ICP minus MAP. So normal is 60 to 110. So anything less than 60 means that your brain's not being perfused adequately. And, um, you'll have anoxia. So things that increase and decrease cerebral blood flow. So things that increase it are hypercapnia, hypoxemia, fluid overload, hyperthermia, and any vasodilating drugs. So these are things that we don't want to happen. We don't want it to be too increased. So a lot of times your neuro patients are going to have um, temperatures, they're neuro, that you've heard them called neuro temperatures, they're sometimes unresponsive to any um, medications. And then things that we do to decrease it to bring more oxygen flow to the brain is have a patient in kind of a hyp hypocapnia state, any diuresis to pull off the extra edema. Um, we don't want them to be hypothermic, but we would like them to be normothermic. Hypothermic is better than hyperthermia. And then any analgesia, analgesics to help reduce that as well. So you kind of want a happy balance. You don't want too much and you don't want too low. So our neuro assessment, um, I know that a lot of you are probably very familiar with the neuro assessment. So you always want to assess mental status. Your mental status is going to be kind of your first indication that something's going wrong. So your patient was previously alert and oriented, and then they're a little loopy. So a lot of people think pupils are the first thing to go. It's actually your mental status. So you'll notice a change in your level of consciousness or just, you know, the patient was answering questions appropriately previously, but isn't answering questions appropriately now. Um, motor is, you know, are they moving? Everything should be symmetrical. Um, anytime that you have a stroke or you're gonna have that contralateral weakness, which meaning it's gonna be opposite side of the injury. So if you have a right-sided stroke, you're gonna have left-sided weakness. And then they can also, depending on severe it is, they can have decerebrate or decorticate posturing. And the way that I remember that is decorticate is they pull up to their core. So when you pinch them, they're gonna pull up to their core and then decerebrate, they're gonna kind of flex out. Um, pupil assessment, so Anytime that you have a bleed, it's gonna be ipsilateral, which is meaning the same side of the affected stroke. 
So what that is, is if you have a right-sided um, bleed, it's going to affect your pupillary cranial nerve. So that's why the pupil is affected on that side, because you're going to have an increased swelling and it's going to, it's going to put pressure on that pupil nerve. And that's what causes your pupil to dilate and or not react because of that pressure on that side. Our GCS NIH was specific to neuro. And then also assessing um, patients can have these because of trauma. So any like raccoon eyes or battle signs, those are signs of um, head injuries or fractures. CSF leak if they have excessive draining from the nose. Um, and then some of your vital signs for worsening bleed and or impending herniation is a widening pulse pressure and bradycardia. So like I said, the first thing that's gonna change is your patient's gonna have some irritability or behavioral change. Sometimes they even just get really agitated. They'll be perfectly fine and they start getting super agitated. So that's kind of your first indication that something um, is going on. And then, like I said, the widening pulse pressure, your heart rate decreases, and then eventually your pupils will um, either dilate and not react or become really sluggish and possibly unresponsive. So let's talk about spinal cord injury. So spinal cord injury can happen for a number of reasons, most common being trauma. Um, sometimes it can be because of disease process, tumor, abscess, or hematoma can really happen to anyone. Um, mechanism of injury just kind of depends on why do you have a spinal cord injury? Um, most common is trauma though. So treatment of spinal cord injury you fluid resuscitation, and then um, sometimes vasoconstrictors don't work because the sympathetic ner nervous system is disassociated because of that injury itself. The pathways become dis um, disengaged. So you want to make sure that these patients stay C-spine, L-spine precautions, head to bed flat, C-collar on. Um, they're going to be getting multiple x-rays, uh, CTs, and MRIs to kind of see at the level and how intrusive the spinal cord injury is itself. So one type of spinal cord injury is brown saccard. So it's normally a knife, bullet, or tumor that's causing a hemisection of the cord. So it's ipsilateral par paralysis, which is same side as the damage, and then ipsilateral um, light vibration, and then contralateral, which is opposite side pain sensation. So it's kind of like a split down the middle as to what, um, what your, um, what am I trying to say? Symptoms of it will be. So again, management, I'm gonna make sure Depending on where the spinal cord injury is, you can have some respiratory involvement. So I wanna make sure that we support that, keeping your head to bed flat, um, treating any, any um, low blood pressure. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Oops. Can you repeat the question so that the people online oh, can hear? Not, not you. She needs to repeat it. Fine. How do I? I'm sorry. I got. You yeah. said I had to exit out and then go yeah. back. That's what I'm saying right now. Okay. Sorry. I messed up my. Oh, it's okay. It's not your fault. I was trying to go back to go to the slide. Yeah. It appears that you have to go back. Yeah. Oops. Okay, so the question was, is how, let me make sure I understood you correct, understanding the ipsilateral and the contralateral, is that what you're wanting? Um, I don't know the best way, I guess maybe understanding exactly what it means Contra, I mean, you could kind of think of like contra is like opposite, contraindicated opposite. So it's ipsilateral is same side, same side, and then contralateral is opposite side. So if you have a right sided bleed, you're going to have ipsilateral pupillary changes because your bleed is increasing in that area and it's providing pressure on that pupillary 
cranial nerve and that's what causes it to increase. But then, so this side talks to this side. So I guess more just knowing like the pathological reasons as to why and behind it. So this side talks to your left side. So your left side motor wise is gonna be affected, but then your pupil is gonna be affected on the side that's happening because of the pressure that's causing. So the vibration is like touch or what? So just like sensation. So any, yeah, so instant sensation. So um, anytime that you have a spinal cord injury, it kind of just depends on how severe it is. You could have total paralysis, total loss of sensation. You could have like, sometimes they have like pins and needles feelings, especially when that like regeneration comes back, they have a lot of nerve pain. So a lot of these patients will be on gabapentin to help with that. And it's just basically those neurons trying to reform back together that disconnect and that um, loss that they had. So it's the begin, sometimes it's when they first have the injury, they can be a lot worse off. And then kind of later on down the road, when everything they're through the healing process, they've been started on like corticosteroids, they can have a regeneration of those nerves and have a little bit more sensation. And sometimes they even regain movement. It just kind of depends on the process and how bad it was and where it was and, you know, multi-factors into it. Does that help answer your question? Okay. You're welcome. Okay, so let's talk about autonomic dysreflexia. So this occurs whenever there is an injury at the spine T6 and above. So basically what happens is you have an injury at T6 and your bladder gets full. So your body tries to send a response and say, hey, my bladder is full. But what happens is it sends the sympathetic response, but when it tries to send the parasympathetic response back down, it's unable to cross where that injury is. So what winds up happening is you have a complete disconnect between your lower body and your upper body. Your upper body is in the rest and digest because it's gotten the signal, it's trying to send it back down to your lower half to get rid of whatever is going on. But then your lower half is like freaking out. It's like, what the heck's going on? So what winds up happening is you have a systemic hypertension, which doesn't make sense because you're like, what the heck, your parasympathetic was activated. Why don't you have lower blood pressure? The response is an exaggerated response because you have that disconnect and what spinal cord injuries do is it disconnects that sympathetic um, inhibitor. So anytime it's activated, it just has like an over exaggerated response. So when that happens, normally it's a full bladder or um, fecal. So those are the two stimuli factors. So the best way to fix this is just to eliminate that. And then the symptoms that the patients are gonna have, they're gonna say that I have a really bad headache, I have a pounding headache. And up top, they're gonna to be flushed because they've got that vasodilation, but below they're gonna be sweaty. So it's like a complete disconnect. Lower half is like fight or flight, upper half is like, I'm chilling, I'm good. So it doesn't make any sense because you're gonna have a low heart rate but you're gonna have a high blood pressure. So those are the big things. If you ever have someone that has a T6 or above injury, and they start saying that they have a pounding headache and they're sweating and they have high blood pressure and low blood pressure, it's most commonly autonomic dysreflexia. And the best treatment is just to eliminate the cause. So you want to kind of go down and say, you know, do they have a Foley? Is it clamped? Are they um, being bladder scanned? Is their bladder full? Have we done their digital stimulation for today? And do they need to have a bowel movement? So let's talk about strokes. So there are two types of strokes. There's an ischemic stroke and there's a hemorrhagic stroke. So a stroke is a sudden or severe disruption of the cerebral circulation with the subsequent loss of neurological function. And for your ischemic stroke, it can either be a clot or it can be plaque. And 85% of strokes are typically <laughs> Oops, sorry. So your ischemic strokes, a lot of times it's your AFib patients or even your patients that have like PFOs that didn't know that they have PFOs and are throwing clots. And then anyone that's got like high cholesterol, diabetes that are higher risk to having those um, plaque. So it's gonna be a sudden onset. You're gonna have um, slurred speech, facial droop. Um, you might have even arm weakness. And then for the treatment for that is 
Anytime you're displaying stroke symptoms, they initially get a non-contrast CT. And then once they realize it's not a stroke, then they'll do um, an IV contrast CT to see exactly where the blockage is. And then depending on where it is, um, they'll go and retrieve it with a cerebral, um, with a diagnostic angio. PFO, patent, patent foramen ovale. So it's like the hole in the heart. Some people get it fixed when they are younger, but some people, they don't close it when they're younger because they think it's gonna close when, as they get older, but some people just don't close. And then some people never even knew they had it until they have an echo. So that's part of the workup whenever someone has a stroke is they will do an echo to check for a PFO as well. So PFO and HP, Sometimes, yeah, I mean, so it can be obviously a multitude of things, but those are probably the most too common is, or if you have some kind of clotting disorder that you didn't know about that you're throwing clots that you're unaware of and maybe need to be on a blood thinner as well. And then also just plaque buildup as well. Anytime, you know, you've got high cholesterol, high, high triglycerides, all that kind of stuff that goes untreated. So either one of those can cause an ischemic stroke. It doesn't necessarily have to be a clot either. Um, so kind of like we said, so left-sided stroke, you're going to have the opposite side that's gonna be affected. So your right side is going to be weak. Um, left side is more of like your language, your speech, your comprehension. Um, the thing about these strokes is they're very aware that they have a stroke, but they don't lack that unawareness as like right-sided strokes do. So a lot of times you'll see them have depression and anxiety. So they're very aware of what's going on, their language and their speech speech is affected. So they've got that aphasia and um, they're very cautious. They're very slow to do things. Whereas right-sided strokes are very impulsive. They don't have any reason. They don't have any judgments. And they're very, it's almost like a frontal type bleed in the sense of like, they're very impulsive. They have that impaired judgment. So the biggest thing about left side is it's your language, your speech, and they're very aware of their deficit. So they have a high increase of um, depression and anxiety. And like I said, right-sided stroke, so your left side is going to be affected. And then they are the ones that they have a very short attention span. Like I said, they're very impulsive. They have safety issues and they have impaired judgment. So not to say that they don't comprehend what's going on, but they're just so impulsive. And they're, those are those patients that are gonna be jumping out of the bed all the time, no reasoning with them. And they're just gonna be a huge safety risk for themselves. So stroke treatment goals. So the goal is door to CT, CT of head for 20 minutes, and then the reading of it should be done within 45 minutes. I believe Grady's technical goal is 90 minutes or 60 minutes for TPA and um, 90 minutes for any intervention, but they're trying to do 60 minutes for TPA and intervention. So not everyone is able to get TPA. There's a lot of exclusion criteria as to why they can not get TPA. So a lot of times they'll end up getting a clot retrieval if it's appropriate. It just depends on where the clot is and what vessel it's in and how small it is. So this is again, just saying door to CT 20 minutes <clears throat> and then read done within 45 minutes. So stroke management, obviously wanna make sure, you know, are they breathing okay? How's their blood pressure? A lot of times, if, um, if it is an ischemic stroke, you'll hear them say permissive hypertension. So these patients are gonna have a blood pressure of like in the 180s and they wanna keep it that way, which is like totally, as a nurse, you're like, what the heck? Don't want this to be high. But it actually, it forces blood around or through that clot to help perfuse that area that's not being perfused. It's not to say it's always gonna be that way, but in the initial acute phase, I do like to allow for that permissive hypertension for that reason. Now with your bleeds, it's different. You don't want your patients to be hypertensive because the higher their blood pressure, the more um, blood they're pumping and the higher risk of that bleed and continuing to increase. So it's just with the ischemic that they allow permissive hypertension, but not with the bleeds. Typically with bleeds, they want your pressure less than 160. So these are all of the exclusion criteria for TPA. So there's a lot. So a lot of times patients will not qualify for TPA. So um, we wanna make sure that we get, the best thing to do before when a patient comes in with stroke-like symptoms is to get a history with them. 
and you want to ask them, are you on any blood thinners? Have you had a history of a bleed? Have you had any procedures done? Because if you've had a bleed, if you had an arterial, if you've had a previous um, abdominal surgery or anything like that, if you're currently on blood thinners, because what TPA does is it's not, it's not specific to anything, you're going to bleed everywhere. So we don't want to give these patients an anticoagulation if they're already anticoagulated or they have um, a reason to have a worsening effect from getting the TPA. So I kind of already went over this. So the thrombectomy will be the um, thing, will be the procedure that takes out the clot and reopens the vessel. It can be a radial or arterial approach. Blood pressure control, we want to allow that permissive hypertension and ischemic patients, but we want to make sure that we control our blood pressure and bleeds for the reasoning of the permissive hypertension allows for better perfusion of the brain until a either TPA or a thrombectomy can be performed to restore blood flow back to that area. Want to make sure that we're doing um, neurovascular assessments and neuro assessments. And then um, these patients will typically be started on aspirin or Coumadin about three, two to three weeks out after, and then aspirin as well, depending on what they got going on. Mm -hmm. Typically, and obviously that's always a talk point with your provider, but typically whenever they first come in, they don't really like to treat anything until they know like what you said. So the question was, I'm sorry, I forgot I had to ask you here too. The question was, was about blood pressures and um, relation to when a patient comes in and if we should treat it or not. So yes, I um, obviously talk with your provider in those situations, but typically they don't because they like to find out if it is a um, ischemic or hemorrhagic, because what happens is if you lower the blood pressure too low, it's going to cause even further anoxia to the brain and worsening conditions for the patient. So yes, um, typically they don't like to overly treat when the patient first comes in. And then once they find out what kind of bleed it is, then they'll go from there. So let's talk about hemorrhagic stroke. So um, neurological deficit caused by interruption of blood flow to the brain caused by a vessel rupture. So there's a lot of reasons as to why you can get a hemorrhagic stroke. Typically um, it's either trauma or hypertension, can be from thrombolytics, anticoagulation or um, bleeding disorders. And then um, aneurysms and AV malformations. So an ICH is an intracranial hemorrhage. So typically these are your um, hypertensive crisis patients. They're gonna come in, their blood pressure is gonna be really high. You're gonna have these patients that either are on blood pressure medication and non-compliant, or they didn't even know that they had blood pressure problems. So these are the patients that typically end up on like cardines um, initially until they can be started on PO to help regulate um, their blood pressures. <laughs> Amyloid and um, angiopathy. So I really don't, what is that? That's a great question. Um, that's a really great question. I'm gonna get back to you on that. And I'm sorry that I don't know the answer to that. Um, and then another reason that, that you can have ICH is the AV malformation, which is your aneurysms. So typically these patients don't even know that they have an aneurysm and until they have an event, um, a significant event. Some are okay and then some are not. Just depends on how bad it is and the location of where it's at. And then tumors can also cause it. And then what happens is tumors are very vascular and the tumors can bleed in that area and cause an ICH. And then an intraventricular hemorrhage. So that is bleeding inside of your ventricles, inside and around your ventricles. Again, typically caused by hypertension um, or, anticoag or anticoagulant therapy. So you want to make sure we're checking these patients' INRs. A lot of times they're going to get vitamin K as a reversal. Um, also can be caused by hydrocephalus as well to where you can have, um, sometimes people have congenital abnormalities. This is why they have an increase in hydrocephalus. And sometimes they have a tumor or a bleed that's causing the blockage that um, causes an increase in the, the CSF in the ventricle fluid, in the ventricle spaces. 
So again, wanna make sure these patients' blood pressure are low, less than 160, and then maintaining a CPP greater than 60. So the thing is with your CPP, you can't measure your CPP unless you're measuring ICP. So the only two ways to measure ICP are through an EBD drain and or through a bolt itself. You can look for clinical manifestations of an increased ICP, but to have a physical number, the only way to have that is through an EBD or a bolt itself. And then we have the subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's an intracranial bleed in the CSF filled space between the arachnoid and the pia mater brains on the surface of the brain in the basal cisterns bleeding into the, into the ventricular system. So what these patients are gonna say when they come in is that they have the worst headache of their life. So a lot of these are caused by aneurysm ruptures secondary to hypertension. And it's going to be very sudden. It's going to be a severe onset. And normally it's after some type of like physical exertion, not always, but typically it is. So I'm sure you guys have heard a lot of like weightlifters or even like young kids after they lift weights and stuff like that, they get really bad headache. So a lot of times um, if a patient has a physical exertion and they're complaining of the worst headache of their life, a lot of times it is an aneurysm rupture. Sometimes they do have a warning before it does leak. Some people don't have a warning. It just kind of depends again on how big it is, where it is, um, as to if they have that. Again, just a subarachnoid typical is the aneurysm or hypertension. Sometimes it can be caused by severe trauma, um, but the typical causes are aneurysm and hypertension. And then just some of the clinical presentations, like I said, they're going to say it's the worst headache of their life. Um, depending on the size of it, they're going to have that restlessness change in um, level of consciousness. And then they also have meningeal irritation sites. And these patients are at risk for vasospasms as well because of that. So again, uh, just want to maintain airway and oxygenation. A lot of these patients are going to have a crany done to alleviate um, the bleed and to take pressure off the brain. We're going to make sure these patients have strict blood pressure parameters because we don't want to increase the blood pressure to then further increase the bleed itself. We're going to get their CT scans, frequent neuros, and then um, the vasospasms, like I said. So what it is, is when the meninges are disrupted and irritated, it's going to cause those vessels to be at risk for spasming. So typically it's, it's their like peak period is like seven to 10 days, but it can happen up to 21 days. And the way that's treated is um, they're started on, on nemotipine, which is a calcium channel blocker. And it helps smooth out those muscles to help reduce the incidence of those vasospasms. And typically when they do have the vasospasms, they're really sick and um, they can have mimic symptoms of a further stroke and um, have worsening condition of their already aneurysm itself. <clears throat> so they go ahead and start these patients proactively on the nemotipine because of that, but it's not to say that they can't have it um, because of it. And then it's kind of the opposite. So if they do experience the vasospasms, we wanna make sure that their pressure is elevated again because we wanna make sure that we're perfusing the area that's being clamped off. And they also, it's a very fine balancing act because they also have an increased risk to rebleed after these situations because of the increase in blood pressure and trying to perfuse the area as well. So a lot of times if they are also worried about them vasospasming, they'll go ahead and put a stent in whenever they do the coiling, um, when they do the, aneur or the crany as well. <clears throat> so this is just the procedures that are typically done when these patients have aneurysms. Um, they can either do a clipping or they can do um, ligation or wrapping or even coiling. So it just depends on Again, location, how bad it is, and what the best approach is whenever they get in there. And then again, um, just post-operative, you want to make sure that any patient they have that has a subarachnoid, that they are some on some type of vasospasm 
agent. So typically it's nimodipine, depends on but, um, what they wanna start, but normally it's nimodipine. Making sure that you're monitoring for that rebleeding. So again, those um, decreased level of consciousness, any pupillary changes and hydrocephalus. And sometimes they can have SIADH. Um, it just kind of depends on the severity of it. If they do go into um, vasospasms, they can, um, but that's kind of like more of the severe. You won't, it's not typical that you see that. It's just more the severe patients. And it's just a mismatch of the uptake of the antidiuretic hormone. So they'll have typically like increased sodiums. You'll, ha you'll notice it, start to notice an increase in their urine output as well. So they have to be put on, um, typically it's like DDAVP and stuff to help regulate that and to replace the hormone that is being inhibited. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. IV nimodipine, typically it's a pill and it's kind of tricky because you have to dissolve it. It's a, it's like a squishy base pill and you have to dissolve it in order to like give it down an NG tube or OG tube or whatever it is in. But typically it's given PO is how it's normally given. Hmm? So typically what happens is it depends on really like where the aneurysm is itself. So what happens is if you have a it's a mismatch in the uptake of the antidiuretic hormone. And basically, normally the body, if it excretes a lot of urine or is excreting a lot of fluid, your antidiuretic hormone will kick in. And whenever you have these bleeds, there's a miss, basically just like a miscommunication in the brain itself and it's not uptaking that hormone. So that's why it has to be given via IV or medication wise to help give it back to the patient. So you'll see like an increase in the urine out, you'll start, they'll start dumping urine and it'll be super clear and it'll be like a thousand a hour. Like you, it'll be very obvious as to how much it is they're dumping. And then what that'll do is they'll be dehydrated. So their sodium will increase. And then anytime you have an imbalance in sodium, it's going to cause cerebral swelling. So it's just kind of that whole cascade of that fine balance of, um, maintaining electrolytes with it and then giving the antidiuretic hormone back as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So typically whenever, if you have like an OG tube or NG tube, a lot of times it'll, you can dissolve it in water and it'll dissolve in the water itself because it can't be broken open or anything like that. So um, the way that I've typically given it in the past is like a little bit of warm water and just kind of dissolve it in the warm water itself. And normally the pill will completely dissolve and you'll be able to give it that way. Um, again, these are just the typical neurosurgery approaches. So burr holes is just a tiny opening in the skull itself. So these are the burr holes are typically done with like subdural hematomas. The goal is to help alleviate any blood in that area. Also, burr holes are done if they are placing a bolt to measure ICP or if they are placing an EVD as well. And then craniotomy is just a surgical opening of the portion of the skull to gain access. And then craniectomy is the actual mobile portion of the skull. So sometimes whenever patients come in and they have a really bad bleed, they'll actually leave their skull flap off. And that just allows for swelling or if they have rebleeding, um, especially if they're in that acute phase, they leave the skull flap off. And then when the patient is kind of out of that window, sometimes it's even an outpatient procedure, they'll come back and have, it's back in the, back in like, I don't say the old days, but a while ago, because it was whenever I was a new nurse, they used to do it. Sometimes they would put it in like in their abdomen or they store it in a fridge. Now they just do like a material type flap over it. Sometimes they do use the bone flap. It just depends on the time in which uh, the patient had it removed and when they have it put back on. But typically they like to put it back on when the patient is like completely out of the acute phase and there's no risk of the patient re-bleeding or having that increased swelling. So these patients, you just wanna make sure, especially if they have the bone flap removed that um, a lot of times they'll have helmets. And then obviously if they're typically in this phase, they're pretty acute, but when they start moving around, making sure that they wear the helmets and they're not bumping their head on the side rail and all that kind of stuff as well. So you just wanna make sure that you take protective measures to um, look out for that side as well. 
All right, so let's talk about traumatic brain injury. So these are your subdural hematomas, your epidural hematomas, and then your concussions. And I don't know why I have them backwards, but we're just gonna roll with it. So your closed head injury concussion. So that's your like blunt trauma. Um, you're gonna have the contusion, partial or complete dysfunction for so less than 24 hours. Sometimes you'll have bruising, laceration may um, occur. And then sometimes you'll have paralysis, but mainly it's just, just like when you, when people bump their head really hard, the main thing with closed head injuries and concussions is that they're going to have a complete recovery within that 12 hour period and not have any deficits from it. And main, the main something that they'll have is a headache. So diffuse axonal injury, these are these patients that are involved in like high speed crashes or um, sports injuries. What happens is, is they hit their head really hard and it causes their brain to shift forward, shift back really hard. And it actually causes a shearing of those axons of the brain and the skull itself. So these can be really mild to really, really bad. Um, they can be kind of have a little bit of altered mental status or they can be completely comatose. So it just depends on, again, um, the severity of it, the nature of it and how bad it is. As far as recovery, brain injury, brain injuries are just funny. It really depends on how the axons reform and the neural pathways regenerate. I've seen patients come in that have been completely comatose when it comes to um, diffuse axonal injuries and walk out of the hospital completely fine. So it really just depends on severity of how bad it is. And the, the coup counter coup injury is what I was saying about how when the brain hits really hard and it hits the front and then shifts back to the back. So that's what it's talking about. And that's what causes that um, shearing of the axons. You can have a diffuse injury and that's typically kind of like the, the um, concussion in the sense of you just have that loss of consciousness within the 24 hours. Um, you can have some amnesia and residual effects, but it's not as severe as the diffuse axonal injury. The axonal is the actual shearing of the um, axons itself. And then um, this is just talking about hypoxic brain damage. It occurs most frequently in arterial disruption between anterior cerebral artery and mid cerebral artery. Um, this also occurs when you have a decreased CPP. So that's what we were talking about with your ICP minus MAP. So anything less than 60 is basically saying your brain is not perfusing. So anytime your brain's not perfusing is whenever um, it's becoming hypoxic. So these are those patients that have even a brief period of hypotension can cause them to have irreversible brain damage. And this is just your management for head injury. So again, just like with everything else, you wanna do your ABCs, um, wanna assess for any additional injuries, wanna make sure your CPP, typically it's greater than 60, sometimes it's 70, depending on what physicians um, want. Normally it's greater than 60 is what the goal is. And then sometimes these patients are prone to seizures. So you wanna make sure that we are doing seizure precautions as well. So your subdural hematomas, so these are typical in your little elderly patients that fall and hit their head. Usually it's venous in nature. And um, it depends on just like anything, depends on the, how severe it is and their clinical picture. Um, some are mild and then some are a lot more severe depending on especially if they have midline shift. Typically these are treated if they're bad enough um, that they need surgery by burr holes, not a crane. So it's just the drilling in the skull to allow for evacuation of that hematoma. And then your epidural hematomas are typically your arterial bleeds. And um, typically these are caused by trauma. So where's the epidural one? So remember Bob Saget a little bit, ago, like probably about a year ago, hit his head, had a brief loss of consciousness, went to bed and then never woke up. So these are your, those are your, um, I don't like that it does this, sorry. Okay. 
So those are your epidural hematomas because they are arterial in nature. So a lot of times the key characteristic to that is they are going to have that brief loss of consciousness. They're going to regain consciousness, but it doesn't mean that they're fine because they have an active arterial bleed that they need to get treatment for. But most people think that they're fine and they'll sleep it off because they just have a headache and then they never wake back up. So that's the difference between the, sub, the subdural is venous and then the epidural is arterial. Yeah. Hemorrhages. Um, I think it's just, so I think they classify it that way because it's like a collection under a certain area and the fact that it's venous in nature. So it's technically still a hemorrhage, but it's just a hematoma. And it's I, more just because of the location of where it is and the areas of the brain of where it is. Um, I talked about that. And then management is still pretty much the same. Want to make sure their airway breathing is good. Um, a lot of times, if you have patients that are really bad head patients, even something as simple as like positioning, making sure their head is in good alignment. Um, if their head is kind of turned, it'll cause increased intracranial pressure, making sure we know our blood pressure parameters. Are we an ischemic patient? We need hyper permissive hypertension. Are we a bleed? And we need to keep our blood pressure less than 160. Um, if they're going to go to the OR to have bird holes for a subdural hematoma or craniotomy to relieve that um, bleed. I talked about that. And then another thing that can cause increased ICP um, is space occupying lesions. So that again can be your um, hemorrhage, can be also be a tumor as well. And then tumors can also bleed. So it can be kind of a dual effect to where the tumor itself is causing an increased ICP, but then it's also bleeding around the tumor as well, can be contributing to it. So let's talk a little bit about ICP management. So ICP itself is pressure within the cranium that is exerted by the combined total volume of three components in the skull. So normal ICP is 10 to 15. Anything greater than 20 is considered an elevated ICP. So some factors that can influence increased pressure is temperature. So those patients that have um, a fever, a lot of times these patients will have unexplained fevers and they'll be deemed as like neuro fevers, unresponsive to Tylenol or any kind of medication. Um, if they're in pain, can cause increased ICP. Blood pressure, elevated blood pressure does. Um, heart function, if they have increased heart rate does. Any intra-abdominal or um, intra-aortic thoracic pressure can cause that. Uh, carbon dioxide acidosis and hypoxia. So some non-pathological stuff, anytime you cough or suction or bear down, um, sudden blood pressure changes, change in body position. Like I said, if they've got their neck kind of turned to the side can cause that sneezing, um, pathological, any of your head injuries are gonna cause that, cerebral edema can cause it, um, hydrocephalus tumor, and then your, the, any of your bleeds are um, hematomas. So early signs of it are gonna be, like I said, your change and level of consciousness. And then they'll kind of start to show motor dysfunction, the contralateral, which will be the opposite side of where the bleed is. And then ipsilateral will be the same side of the bleed. And then late signs are if they become comatose, pupils are fixed and dilated. Um, a lot of times you'll see what's called a Cushing triad. So you'll see their blood pressure shoot really, really high. You'll have that widening pulse pressure. And then they'll also have bradycardia as well. And when they get in this Cushing triad, there's really nothing you can try and decrease their blood pressure. But what the Cushing triad is impending is herniation. So um, sometimes you can start like carding and stuff like that. But kind of when they've kind of hit this point, their impending herniation as well, especially if they've already had those early signs of um, change in altered mental status and pupil dysfunction. If they've gotten to the point where their pupils are fixed and dilated and you're seeing that Cushing triad, um, you're probably impending herniation. You can give mannitol, absolutely. Yeah, in that situation, you can give mannitol for sure.
And then this again is just talking about the um, EVD placement. So it's done via the burr hole approach. It's a catheter that actually goes into your ventricles and drains the excess um, CSF fluid that is collecting in your ventricles. So you can manage, you can measure ICP off of this and they, you can also put a bolt in as well. Most of the time they'll just go ahead and put in the EVD because a bolt is a bolt and you can't drain with that. So a lot of times they'll put in an EVD as well because you can, it's a two-fold situation you can drain and you can also um, measure ICP with that as well. So, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's okay. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, I say it's okay, but you're the one that couldn't speak. So. Yeah, it's a sorry. I'm and I'm probably lulling you to sleep with all this information too. So. Um, the EVD system itself is a closed system, like I said, to drain CSF and alleviate increased ICP measures ICP itself. Um, so the drain itself should be put on a separate pole. It is has a leveling tool on it, and it should be leveled at the tragus, which is the ear right here. So anytime you're laying your patient down, if you're traveling, if you're moving, anything like that, you should always be clamping that because anytime it's not leveled, you can have an increase of um, CSF fluid draining off, and that can cause a rebound edemia and then possibly cause herniation as well. So anytime you're moving the patient, anytime you're doing anything with the patient, sometimes I even clamp it, um, you know, something as simple as like, moving their head just a little bit. Anytime that you're changing the position that it's not perfectly level to the EVD itself, you should be clamping it and then re-leveling it whenever you get the patient back to the position that they're in. Um, so it's just a management, you wanna make sure you keep their head about 30 degrees. Like I said, you want their head midline facing is important as well too. Wanna to try and keep them as no normal thermic as possible. Like I said, sometimes it's difficult to regulate temperature, especially in the acute phase, because they're gonna have a fever that's unresponsive to medication. So you gotta kind of get creative um, doing you know, ice packs, that kind of stuff to help reduce it, but then also wanting to prevent shivering because that's gonna also increase your ICP as well. And then um, making sure that they're properly sedated, they have proper pain medica medication, and then um, ensuring that they're on the correct fluids. You wanna make sure that they're not on an isotonic fluid because that can also cause cell swelling and cause increased edema. So a lot of times they like to do plasma alight because it's the most equal to your own blood and not gonna cause those big shifts. So again, this is just the management of it, you want to make sure that they are, sometimes you can measure their birth suppression to see how sedated they are to titrate your sedation to that. Some patients even require um, being paralyzed to make sure that their ICPs are under control. They can be put into a hypothermic state. This does reduce ICP. And then, um, like I said, you just have to make sure that they're not shivering because that will then increase your ICP. Um, a lot of times you'll see these patients on a higher respiratory rate on the ventilator because um, you want to blow off that CO2 because CO2 is a vasodilator. And then surgery, what we talked about. So we'll get into, we're going to talk about the osmotic diuretic. <clears throat> so mannitol, like she said a little bit ago, is a specific diuretic to the brain itself. So this, whenever you give this, it'll specifically move, remove any extra fluid to reduce the edema on the brain itself. Um, there is some special administration stuff with that. You wanna make sure it's not crystallized and you do need to give it with a filter. Um, a lot of these patients will be on a continuous hypertonic saline. So that's like your 3%, your 23.4. You wanna make sure that you're doing um, Q6 hour, osmos and sodium with those because it's again a fine balance you don't want your sodium to be too low but you don't want it to be too high so you want to make sure that we keep the fine balance with that and then like I said about the plasma light so this is your normal so you always want to know what it is to trend it and then um, I believe it's the new order is like if your sodium is greater than 155 you discontinue your 3%. So we don't want it to be too high. 
And then these are just the signs and symptoms of hypernatremia and hyponatremia. And then hydrocephalus, we talked about a little bit. So um, again, that's just an accumulation of CSF in the intracranial space and, and, the, and, and the ventricles. So it can be a congenital or it can be communicating, which is the CSF is blocked after leaving the ventricles, or it can be non-communicating where it's obstructed the ventricles itself. So it's just a disruption in that flow um, can be caused by a subarachnoid hemorrhage, head trauma, infection, tumor, complications from surgery. Um, sometimes these patients that they have congenital um, hydrocephalus, they've got the, what are called VP shunts. And sometimes those shunts can become um, not functioning and then cause them to have hydrocephalus because of that. And then seizures. So you've got tonic, clonic, absent, and a tonic, and then subclinical and non-epileptic. So these patients, a lot of times diagnostic-wise, they're gonna do EEGs to see um, how severe the seizure activity is. Um, they're the patients that are gonna be getting in your Ativan. Wanna make sure you're watching out for um, airway safety, always having suction set up in the room. And then this is just definition. So it's exaggerated activity continued um, for up to 24 hours within normal treatment. So it can be caused by a multitude of different things, alcohol withdrawal, toxic levels of drugs, infection, stroke, or even um, trauma can cause it as well. Sometimes these patients require intubation. It just depends on the severity of which their um, seizures are. And then delirium, you guys probably deal a lot with this um, in the ICU itself. So anyone in the ICU is at risk. Um, CAM assessment is important to determining early factors of it. Um, it can start as early as two days in the ICU and actually increases people's risk of death threefold within the six months. So delirium can definitely have a negative effect on people. Um, anytime someone is on the ventilator for a long time, they're at increased risk as well or on sedative medication for a long period of time. So there's no true treatment for delirium. A lot of it is focused on prevention of it. So obviously we can't help it if a patient is intubated and sedated for a long period of time because of medical reasons. But you know the things that you guys already do, making sure that they've got the lights on, day-night orientation, um, doing your CAM assessment to recognize it easy or quicker. Sometimes um, they do start them on Haldol, just depending on how, but again, that's that fine balance with um, not over sedating because that also contributes to it as well. And then dementia, most common um, is Alzheimer's, it's, uh, memory, reasoning. So sometimes it can be caught, it, a lot of times it's caused by like substance abuse, any medications, even like a B12 deficiency, and there's also an AIDS-associated dementia. And then brain death. So the cardinal sign of brain death is coma. Um, any absence of cerebral motor responses, absence of brain stem reflexes. And then um, I believe the protocol here is to have a physical exam and a diagnostic. So a lot of times they'll do an apnea or you'll have a cerebral blood flow to test for brain death itself. And then LifeLink, you would consult LifeLink early on. Even, I think LifeLink's changed their criteria to even patients that are vented now. Um, they've kind of eased up a lot on their criteria and broadened it out to capture more people. Um, so now we're gonna talk about neurological infections. So that is your, Meningitis, um, viral and bacterial. So a meningitis is the inflammation of the meningi meninges of the CSF within the subarachnoid space caused by bacteria, virus, or fungus. Um, the blood bar barrier is interrupted. And then, so typically with your, let me go to the next slide, I just want to explain some more. Okay, so 
Aseptic can be caused by either virus or fungi. Typically viral is the more common one. Bacterial is the one that is, um, has more worsening effects. So virus is typically caused by like herpes simplex and they, you don't treat it with antibiotics. Typically you treat it like a cyclovirus or um, kind of just supportive therapy. But bacterial, um, it's typical in kids. A lot of times it has, it has decreased its incidence because of vaccines. And a lot of times it's caused by the strep B um, whenever the mom is giving birth, if she wasn't um, tested for that. A lot of times it's caused by that itself. So bacterial is a lot more um, severe because it creates a worsening inflammatory response. So the biggest difference between the two is when you do a CSF culture or CSF um, testing for the bacterial, it's going to be cloudy because it's going to have more white blood cells. It's going to be decreased in glucose and higher in proteins, whereas your um, CSF or your viral is just going to test positive for the virus itself that could be potentially causing the meningitis. But the bacterial, you're going to have that cloudy specimen and it's going to have those results in the CSF as well. For both, you're going to have headaches, fever, might have some um, light sensitivity, but a lot of times with the bacterial, you're gonna have more of your neurological symptoms because it's going to cause more of an inflammation and an inflammatory response. And it's gonna cause those meninges to be more inflamed and cause more of a neuro response than anything. And then neuromuscular disorders. So MS is an autoimmune disorder caused by demyelinization and slowing communication between the neurons. So the myelin sheath, myelin sheath itself allows for nerve impulses to travel. So the demyelination causes a decrease in nerve impulse traveling, which causes sensory, cognitive, and motor problems. Symptoms are slow and gradual. A lot of times they have nystigmus, uh, dysarthria, and intentional tremor diagnosed by MRI and CSF as well can show high levels of antibodies. I didn't know this, but it's typically common in females more than males as well, especially younger ages too. And then Guillain-Barre is it also an autoimmune res immune response to a viral infection. It causes destruction of the myelin sheath itself. So these patients, it's important to get these patients history because a lot of times they are going to complain of a um, infection within the past two weeks. Typically it's upper respiratory infection. And the key sign with this is you're gonna have ascending motor loss. So it's gonna start in your toes and move up. There's no real treatment for it. It's more just supportive therapy um, and supporting any symptoms that the patient may have. Sometimes it does increase far enough to where the patient has to be put on a ventilator until the symptoms subside. And then myosin and gravis is also an autoimmune disease that affects skeletal muscles. So what it does is it decreases the acetylcholine receptor function, which worsens muscle use. So these patients are gonna have worsening muscle weakness with activity that will improve with rest. So the more that they do the activity, it's gonna decrease the receptor. So whenever they're at rest, it allows them to reuptake um, that acetylcholine. Sometimes it can affect your diaphragm. You wanna avoid any exacerbating drugs, which are your beta blockers, your aminoglycosides, and your tetracyclines. Um, treatment for these is the antacetylcholinase in inhibitors, which is your neostigmine, and sometimes immunosuppressant drugs, which is your prednisone. Sometimes they can remove the thymus, um, which the thymus is where the T cells are produced, and the T cells help the B cells make antibodies, which the B cells are what inhibit the um, receptor function itself. So sometimes when they remove that, they see improvement um, because those T cells are no longer able to help make the B cells antibodies. Any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Like, so are you trying to like, so zero it and stuff like that? Is that what you're talking about? Right. Or the taking, like, are you talking about taking the cap off to like zero it? Is that what you mean? Right. So the setup should be to where you shouldn't have to take the cap off too, because it does introduce bacteria when you do take the cap off, because it should be a closed system. And then as far as moving it up and down, I mean, you do have to move the, the whole system, like the plastic part itself, not so much. So there's two parts to it. There's a big plastic part and then the front part, like the chamber itself, you can move that up and down or you can move the whole plastic part up and down. Are you talking about the plastic part or the like chamber itself? Uh, so, uh, I guess the zero you cannot be careful. Most you have to be the, the part in the so zeroing it is just you're really zeroing it to the monitor itself. So that's what I'm thinking about when you're saying zero that. Are you talking about something? Are you talking about leveling it to the patient? Yeah. I don't know. Some people just put that on. You know how you zero it mm -hmm. They open the in house. Mm -hmm. I think they mean this thing. You shouldn't have to. I mean, if it's set up appropriately, you shouldn't have to be taking the cap off to zero it. And then as far as like moving it up and down, you have to move it up and down to get it level with the patient itself. You just basically want to prevent any opening of the drain itself to allow any bacteria in there because it's a straight source to the brain itself. But the plastic part you can move up and down, that doesn't affect like the opening of the system itself. You're just moving it up and down to level it to the patient. Did that answer your question or no? No, you do have to zero it again. You, but you shouldn't be. There should. The way that it should be set up is you shouldn't be taking the cap off because you're leveling to the transducer itself. You shouldn't be leveling to air. I wish I had one. To show. Electrical caps to the question. So that's what they're asking. So leveling is different than zeroing. Okay. Zeroing yes. is saying to your monitor, you yes. see atmospheric pressure, which means you must open atmospheric pressure as zero. So zero means different than level. So in the uh, neural unit, you probably oftentimes are using, maybe you're using bolts that are zero before the plate, but never need to be zero again. But with uh, intraventricular drain, what they're talking about is that they have, they zero. So you're, I think what you're saying is also correct. Uh, the only time you actually really have to be zero is when we see that there's some problems with the reading or the waveforms. We don't need, although I think Epic requires them to zero like every four hours or once a step, mm -hmm. we don't actually need to open that up. So when you're on when you're working with an uh, with with an EBD, how often could you be zero? I mean, so I don't know what Brady's policy is for zeroing, but anytime that you're disconnecting it and like going to travel or anything like that, just how you would do your A-line and have to re-zero it to get it back on the monitor. I mean, just like she said, re-zeroing itself is just to the monitor itself. It's not to the patient. patient. So you're re-zeroing it just how you would re-zero your A-line to the transducer itself. So leveling it is ensuring that it's at the proper level because if you have it too low or too high, it's either not gonna drain or it's gonna drain too much. So that's the purpose of wanting your drain level to the tragus and the patient itself, because if you have it too high or too low, it's going to pull off too much or not enough. Because what they do is like where the chamber itself, the physician will let you know as to what level they want it at. So the chamber itself is preset by the physician. So even with you moving it up in the plastic part up and down, you're not moving the actual like pool of the CSF itself. You're just simply moving the, just as you would move your A-line up and down to level it to your patient. That's the same concept with the EBD itself when you're moving it like that. You're not causing, you're not disrupting anything. You're just moving it to where it can be leveled to the patient. Does that make sense? I wish I had one to show you because it would be so much easier to, yeah. yeah. yeah I, think, <laughs> I think there's, what I would tell you is that I think there's a lot of controversy about how to do things yeah. The number one, a lot of people are uh, will actually open for both drain and monitoring at the same time. Mm -hmm. And 
That is not advised. No. You are trained and you don't advise that. You need to monitor your brain. And the discussion about Puro is to stop talk is turned off to the patient, but you do take the dead head off so that you're actively visualizing after the Puro presence. But what, what Courtney is reminding us is that every time you do that, you may be so you don't want to obviously do as much but really like um, Barbara said you shouldn't be re-zeroing as much as you're re-zeroing your A-line I mean most of these patients are going to be in the bed and they're not going to be moving that much now when you travel and you disconnect and you have to come back you probably will have to re-zero it to get it back on your monitor but it shouldn't be like every four hour thing that you're doing by any means so I think what really helps us in this situation is to remember that intravascular catheters are more apt to be dislodged, displaced, and they have to be zero frequently. This is not an intravascular catheter. And that's why you don't, first of all, you don't put pressure against it, right? You don't have a pressure bag associated mm -hmm. with it because it's not intravascular. You don't want to be introducing fluid at three fifteenths an hour into a closed chamber. The other thing is, what Courtney is reminding you is that it's highly unlikely that you're going to lose physiologic pressures to atmosphere. And what you have to think about, and really quite honestly, Courtney, we should probably assure, because I don't think it's well spelled out in, in any policy, but we should assure that people understand <laughs> that they don't need to zero reference unless. Yeah. They've lost their signal mm -hmm. or the signal is supremely damp. Otherwise, we shouldn't be zero. And, yeah. But that's in direct conflict with what people are being teached at one fish. So it might be different in Euro. They might, be, I'm sure, be precepted yeah. very particularly. But in the other series, we're actually placing an extra that uh, extra ventricular drain is terrifying, even though they're totally comfortable with other kinds of pressure monitoring. Mm -hmm. Very uncomfortable with this, and their charge nurse from today says something, the charge nurse tomorrow says something else. They're probably telling them something else. There's not really straightforward guidance. So, I will say if you guys do want to learn like in depth stuff about EVD, Janisha has a neurotrauma class that she does, and she goes like you can play with the EVD, she goes into like way further depth than anything that we did today. So she does have that available. And I believe that you can sign up on Grady University. If not, I'll let you know, but um, I'm 99.9% .9 sure it's on Grady University. So if you do want to take something like that and learn more about it and have something more in depth about it, she does offer that. Some conflicting. See, I I was taught not to, and that's what I'm familiar with. So honestly, I'll have to. to you said you had an EVD boot camp right. yesterday. So the EVD educators are ED, ED. skills. Got, of, okay, so like competencies. I'll, I'll put you guys in touch. Okay, I'll um I'm gonna talk with Janisha and I'll get more information since it sounds like there's some conflicting information. Out there's there. an opportunity to do more, uh, more in depth. Sure. And yeah. Particularly in the community, I think honestly, I would say I, I would be very concerned about the opening of your ICP drain for zero referencing after the initial zero has been done. Yeah. Okay. It's not like some magic the whole thing for zero I mean, is some magic bullet. It, it, you know, you're not in, in a vessel. You just you don't have the dynamic, you don't have dynamic flow. You have dynamic changes, but not dynamic flow. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm going to send you a note. Right okay, here. yeah, and I wrote myself a note as well, too, to follow up on that. Um, I know it was a lot. You guys, um, I can give you my email address if you have any questions or anything. Um, I think that you guys have the printout, right? They have the printout. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can resend it and um, I'll do that. Yeah, I sent the link and they have to go one drive to download. Oh. Uh, 
again. So some of you got that. You did not get it. Oh, well, there was like two more than five that weren't on there. Uh, oh, she had it all day. I I think it's the same one. I don't I didn't the one that I sent you is I didn't add anything to it from the one I sent you um the other day. I can resend it. I'll I can resend it. Yeah. Yeah, like the brain blank on there. Okay. I can resend it to you. I, I don't know why it would be that. That's weird. Yeah, that's weird. Okay. I can resend it though. Okay, sure. Okay. Well, you guys don't have any questions. I will follow up about the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, they do? I don't know how effective it is. I mean, the one that I'm typically used to using is just the pill form. I don't know if sometimes, I feel like sometimes in brain injury patients, they're kind of not, they don't want to use nasal inhalants, but I don't know if it's practiced here and they use it here. I'd have to ask pharmacy as to what they're typical if they're using that, but that's interesting though. Yeah. It's very interesting. Did you guys work last night? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm sorry that you guys had to come and sit through this. Hopefully it wasn't too terrible and you don't live too far. I know it's raining, so at least it's a good day for, oh, there's more. <laughs> um i don't know how to do i don't want to mess this up okay just leave it okay Let's be sure there weren't any questions. There is a question on the chat line. Oh, so let's let's click on that. Okay, my friends. Hi, thank you very much. We have a question. Oh, nope. Just thank oh, you. Okay. Molly May says thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Okay, guys. So I am. So, oh, I'm so sorry about the lights because I thought I could control them from here, but I actually cannot. And uh, Epic Health just emailed me and said, call facilities. Well, we're, oh, we're not going to call facilities now because we're already well into class. Okay, so I think one of the things I want to do is just kind of take a little pulse here, see how everybody's doing. And uh, I, I, I actually had planned to, to talk today because I thought that we were going to have a full two hours. So want to just talk really quick quickly want to do a quick overview of a couple of concepts that are really, really, really important um, that I think Courtney presented to you, but I'm going to present in a little bit different way. I'm going to try to give you a little bit of information. I don't have any slides, guys, so because I really wasn't planning to speak, so I just want to talk about a couple of things. When, when we think about signs and symptoms of spinal cord injury, I want you to remember that above, basically the way you will think about this is that from the chin and above, when you have neurologic injury from the chin and not spinal cord injury, but neurologic injury from the chin and above in terms of motor response, it will be on the same side as your injury. That's called ipsilateral right? I think you asked a question about that. So I'm just trying to make it easy. It's, there's lots of, I mean, there's so much to know and Courtney did such a fantastic job, but to make it a little bit easier. So that's why pupil is on same side, but motor nerves cross over at the medulla oblongata. So from the chin and below, it's going to be the opposite side. Did that help you? Okay, so that's just trying to make it a little bit easier. Okay, so that you were asking for something easy. So, you know, Courtney is the neurologic expert. I'm kind of the expert at trying to make things easier. So that's really important. Okay, so motor crosses over motor nerves. So those are outgoing nerves 
crosses over from enter, exiting from the motor cortex, those fibers descend and cross over to the opposite side and then descend the spinal cord. Sensory, and that's not gonna be all sensory. It's not gonna be everything. It's not gonna be light touch, deep touch, you know, vibration, proprioception, all these different things, but general sense. So do you feel me touching you? Sensory crosses over at the point of entry and then a sense, okay? So that's why that's really important. So let me say that again. Motor fibers coming out of the brain cross over at the medulla oblongata. So that's the connection of the spinal cord to the brain crosses over at the medulla oblongata and descend. So anything above the medulla oblongata in general, not everything, but in general, will be same side, but below the medulla oblongata will be the opposite side. Everybody good? You understand what I've said? Sensory, and this is gonna be more about spinal cord injury, general sensory crosses over at the point of entry and then ascends to the brain. Why that's important uh, in, in terms of CCRN, and again, I'm, I'm making things very simple. Courtney is the expert. I'm just trying to make this simpler for you to just kind of help you with this. Where this is important is historically a question that is frequently asked on the exam about brown sequard syndrome. So I've had a spinal cord injury, C5, C, C5, C4, and I'm gonna lose motor on one side, but sensory on the other. Okay? The problem with brown sequard is a hemitransection. So half of your spinal cord has a lesion and that will have sensory function on the opposite side of motor function. You'll lose motor on one side, you'll lose sensory on the other side. That's brown sequard, hemitransection. Motor one side, Sensory opposite. This isn't a cerebral injury, it's a spinal cord injury. No, no, I'm just, I was just saying that. On uh, anywhere brown support is below that injury, you will lose motor on one side and sensory on the other. Okay. If it's a cortical injury, you may lose motor and sense on the same side, I, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Let me, let me just think about the, let me wipe that out. I don't wanna say that. Only wanna talk about brown support right now, okay? Because they asked particular questions. So what does that mean? It means that I've lost motor because of my hemitransection. It depends on whether it's a right side or a left side hemitransection, okay? I've lost motor on my right hand and I've lost sensory on my left hand, okay? So I can't move my right side, but I can cook with my left side and I'm stirring a pot of boiling water filled with spaghetti noodles and I'm not looking. My hand is down in the boiling water and I'm being burned, I won't have any idea that that's happening. Okay, this is the specificity of brown sequard syndrome, is that on the side where I've lost motor, and most persons come to the bedside and they say, well, they don't have motor on that side, so they don't have sensory on that side either. So we're like pulling, yanking, you know, doing whatever. And there is a little cap from your, from your, uh, your syringe underneath that arm. That amount of stimulus is incredibly and profoundly painful, but I can't move. 
And unless I can say to you, there's something under my wrist that is killing me. And you're my, you might be a nurse who isn't really very evolved. And you might say, oh, that's crazy. You can't move that side. So you must not be able to feel on that side. Well, that's not true. Hemitransection, from my point of view, is really profoundly even more altering than full transection. When you have a full transection of the spinal cord, you lose both motor and sensory, motor going down, sensory coming up. With a hemitransection, you lose motor on the side of the transection and sense on the opposite side. Everybody understanding what I'm saying? Why that's so dangerous is because it is easy to overlook this and look at a patient who has motor loss from a hemitransection and without actually understanding the anatomy, that's what it is, anatomy, we're assuming that on the side they cannot move, that they cannot feel. And that is not true when it's a hemitransection. Okay, exactly. So my, my lovely friend says, Wow, because this is a bad deal. This is a bad deal. Quite, I mean, I'm, I haven't got a spinal cord injury, but quite honestly, having a complete injury means you've lost both motor and sense. I'm not saying that's better or worse. I'm just saying to, to have loss of sense on the side you can move and loss of motor, but high, and, and again, you've lost motor. Your, sensi your sensitivity on that side is really profound. And that's really, really important. So that's when, when there's a question about brown support or hemitransection, and almost always there is, even though it's a small percent of what we see, because it's something that nurses need to be very acutely aware of. So there are oftentimes questions about that. Okay, good. Did that help you a little bit? Okay, so I think it's just, and again, when we just, when we talk about neurologic evaluation, we're talking about cerebral injury, right? I just want you to remember that motor nerves, so nerves that control pupil response to light, your, your tongue movement, your smile, your frown, Typically, not everything, but typically uh, from a, the chin and above, what you see is predicting the same side dysfunction. Below the chin will be opposite. So that means if I've had a right cerebral hemispheric bleed and I have compression of my cranial nerves, I'm going to see a loss of pupil reflex on that right side, but loss of movement on my left side. Okay. That's not the spinal cord. That's the cortex. So separate what happens in the cortex from what happens at the spine. Does that make sense? Does it make it clear? I mean, it may have already been a hundred percent clear. It's more clear. Okay. So um, want to talk a little bit, a little bit more about MG and GB, myasthenia, uh, myasthenia gravis and Gillian Barre. Again, I kind of want to give simple takes on this, really simple takes. Myasthenia gravis is, is like giving your patient a neuromuscular blocking agent. What the problem with myasthenia gravis is, is a loss of the neurotransmitter from the end of your nerve fiber to the muscle plate. So what has to be carried across here, right? Requires a neurotransmitter and that neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. So what happens with myasthenia gravis is I run out of acetylcholine. I don't, what happens is, I don't wanna make it too complicated, but normally you and I, we use acetylcholine. So every time I'm moving around, I'm using acetylcholine, but I uptake the acetylcholine and reproduce it. With myasthenia gravis, you have a small presence of acetylcholine, but you're not going to actually uh, recirculate it, recycle it. So you run out of acetylcholine pretty quickly. And when you run out of acetylcholine, 
you're going to see something that is really, really important when we're talking about critical patients. Myasthenia gravis in exacerbation. So that means I've had an injury, I've had an MI, I've had some pneumonia, I've got sepsis. I'm going to see a very aggressive utilization of myacetylcholine. And I will present with what is called, and did she say this to you, descending paralysis? That's really important. So what you see first is failure really of your lids and your eye movement that descends. You get, you get uh, more and more dysphagic to aphasic and it descends. And the descent, once it is to the diaphragm, you'll stop breathing, okay? descending paralysis with myasthenia gravis. So on a question on an exam without, again, I'm not a neuro expert. So, but on a question on an exam about myasthenia gravis, it would be your patient presents with bilateral lidtosis. Okay, it's bilateral. So that right away says it's probably not a bleed or a, a, another kind of head injury because those typically not always present in a unilateral presentation. Bilateral lidtosis, cheek lag, difficulty with speech. And then we descend further. And once, once we involve the diaphragm, the patient will stop breathing. People with myasthenia gravis have a lifetime condition. That lifetime condition is treated by assuring that you are supporting acetylcholine. So the agents typically that we use for patients with myasthenia gravis and with the letters N-O-N, mystignon, really ends with O-N, tensilon. We do a tensilon test. We put them on mystignon. Here's the thing. You are always consuming this acetylcholine. And it means that when they have any kind of physiologic stress or they increase their uh, function. So I've decided I'm feeling pretty good today. I'm going to go take a mile walk. Well, the first quarter of a mile, I feel great. The second quarter of a mile, I'm really tired. The third quarter of the mile, I can barely lift my legs or I can barely lift my arms, I should say. And in the fourth quarter of the mile, the last quarter, I really can't breathe because even though I'm on medication, my, my physical stress has exacerbated my condition. And I'm gonna live like that the rest of my life. That's really important. Myasthenia gravis is a lifetime chronic uh, illness that has acute exacerbations all the time. What that means to you as a nurse is you are not one, I don't care how busy you are, I'm sorry. You cannot be one minute late with their anticholinesterase medications. Not one minute. They are on a program. And by the way, you're a minute late, you're five minutes late, you're 10 minutes late, they're on the light. I need my medication. I need my medication. And I can visualize because I've been a nurse. I know we're all really busy. I can visualize that people are like, God, that guy's always on the light about his medication because he knows that every minute past the time of his anticholinesterase, that cholinesterase, which destroys the acetylcholine, that every minute that goes by, he's more likely to be in crisis. So nursing implications are never, ever late with that medication, never, okay? And mestignon is the one typically that we're using or a variable of mestignon. And they stay on a rigorous schedule. They are never late with their medication. Good. Does not affect the heart muscles. It affects muscles that are primarily, primarily parasympathetic mediation. Okay. So as far as I know, let me say it that way. Again, reminding you, I'm not a neuro expert, but I'm going to remind you of that. Gillian Bure. So I want to remind you what Gillian Bure is. Gillian Bure is a loss of the myelin sheath of your outgoing motor fibers. So leaving the spinal cord, going out to the periphery, 
you have a myelin sheath. The myelin sheath is like the rubber, uh, for lack of a better word, probably isn't rubber, the rubber coating of any of your plugs, right? You plug into the wall to get power and that power transmits along the cord and the power transmits along the cord. But if you fray the rubber, you're gonna lose the current. Everybody good with that, with that analogy. So with Guillain-Barre, you have an inflammatory process that destroys the myelin sheath, which means you lose the control of the traffic of motor stimulation. So it's not at the receptor site and the transmission across, which is what MG is, Guillain-Barre is about loss of the myelin sheath. So you actually lose your potential, uh, your electric potential that stimulates your muscles, okay? Again, Guillain-Barre is primarily, primarily related to myelin sheath, which is historically more related to parasympathetic discharge. In crisis, Guillain-Barre presents in an ascending paralysis. Thank you, Lord, for taking something so severe and significant as neurologic injury and separating this. MG, descending paralysis. GB, Guillain-Barre, ascending paralysis. Now, typically this is induced by your physiologic response to a hyperinflammation. And oftentimes it's viral. We see it, we see it with a hyperinflammatory response to vaccines. We see it in patients post-flu. And the sooner your patient is recognized and treated for what their primary issue is, the less myelin is involved and the more likely it is that you will have recovery. Now, it's not an ongoing issue. If you've had it once, you are probably gonna, you may have it again, but it's highly related to hyperinflammatory types of syndromes, to viral reactions, to antigen, antigenic reactions. So really, really important. Remember, Guillain-Barre is a little bit more controlled than MG. And in crisis, it's an ascending paralysis, starting at the feet, sometimes a little worse on one side or the other, not really predictable as far as I know, remembering that I'm not a neuro expert. But what I want you to remember for your exam is the presentation is that it's the patient had a flu three weeks ago. They present to the ED today with loss of motor to their feet. They can't stand. And while they're in the ED, they start to lose motor function of the leg. So now they're going to ascend to the, to the diaphragm. So Guillain-Barre, ascending paralysis, myasthenia gravis, descending paralysis, okay? Okay, was there any discussion? I didn't hear it about DI, diabetes insipidus. Yes or no? Okay, so that's gonna be really important. That's gonna be, a, that's gonna be a concept for you on your exam. And again, I'm sorry, I don't have any slides. I'm just talking and I'm talking in the dark too. So that's the other thing. So uh, I'm okay with it as long as you can see my friends. So I just wanna focus on diabetes insipidus. So first of all, I'm gonna tell you something that's not gonna be on your exam. I don't think it will be, but you never know. They don't usually update until things are really broadly clinically accepted. Uh, we're no longer gonna call this diabetes insipidus. So if you're in a neuro unit, maybe if you're in a surgical trauma unit or you're working with docs uh, and providers who are really keeping up to date on the literature, it will no longer be called DI. It will be called aqueous vasopressin deficiency, AVD. A V D. Aqueous. aqueous. Uh, I'm sorry, not aqueous. Arginine. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Aqueous or arginine. I can't remember. It's just brand new. So the A is just defining the type of vasopressin. So aqueous or arginine, vasopressin deficiency. Okay. That doesn't change the disease state. It says to everybody, stop thinking because there's the word diabetes in here yeah. that this is about hyperglycemia. It is not. 
So let me define diabetes insipidus because that's probably the way it will be referred to on your exam. Okay. And um, my next talk, I will put up, I will make sure you get a slide that shows the differences in these two new neurologic issues. So we have the neurologic issue of myasthenia gravis pillion bray. We have the issue of, is it above or below the medulla when we're talking about head injury? And is it below the transection with the spinal cord injury? Okay. So with um, diabetes insipidus, the reason, so what this, what those words mean is a weak form of diabetes, meaning nothing to do with glucose. It's insipid, meaning nothing to do with glucose. But what it shares with diabetes is polyuria. So whether it's diabetes insipidus, whether it's referred to on your exam as AVD, vasopressin deficiency. You know, really it would have been great if we just could have called it VD, but then that would have confused it with something else. And that would have been as, uh, you know, sexually transmitted diseases. So that's why they had to put the A in front, which describes the form of vasopressin, okay? Diabetes insipidus is the inability to conserve water. Vasopressin regulates water reabsorption. When water is reabsorbed, salt will follow, but it's really about water. I cannot conserve water. I'm gonna make 10 liters of urine output in 12 hours. So what's gonna to happen to me? I'm gonna be in hypovolemic shock, okay? Inability to conserve water. I'm not wasting salt, I'm wasting water. So because I'm wasting water, salt is always measured in relationship to water. So when I'm looking at that patient, their serum sodium is gonna be high. Their serum concentration is gonna be high. But when I look at the urine, they're not wasting salt. They're just wasting a lot of water, okay? Now, I wanna make sure you remember the whole role of urine output is to keep your blood perfect. So if my serum is concentrated, my urine should be concentrated. But I'm looking at this patient who has a serum sodium of 158 and a serum osm of 328, and they're making a liter of urine, if I'm lucky seeing them in the beginning, a liter of urine an hour. Right away, I say something's wrong. They're not controlling and regulating the way they should. The purpose of, there are many purposes of vasopressin, but in this state, the purpose of vasopressin is to promote conservation of water. Your patient's losing water. That's what looks like diabetes, and that's why it was originally called diabetes insipidus. However, the term diabetes insipidus for people that are struggling to understand they're always thinking it's about hyperglycemia. Why isn't the patient on insulin? Your patient isn't hyperglycemic. He's hypovolemic and hypernatremic. Salt stays in, water goes out. Inability to conserve water. Good DI. Very, very basic explanation. The opposite of DI is the inability to excrete water. So I'm going to retain my water and I'm not going to release it. My serum sodium goes down, my serum osm goes down, and I'm always releasing a little bit of sodium, but now I'm not releasing water. So my urine sodium goes up. Because sodium is measured in relationship to water and I'm not processing any water. Now that patient, the SIADH patient, so this is all happening in the face of a neurologic injury. This is a neurologic disturbance. Happening in the face of a neurologic injury, my patient is gonna look volume overloaded. He's gonna look like he has renal failure. He's gonna look like he has heart failure. He's got a whole lot of water on board and he is indeed hypervolemic. It's the inability to excrete water, okay? So vasopressin 
is known or was previously known. It was a very good name, but it made us focus only on that one property of vasopressin. There's lots of properties as anti-diuretic hormone. So if I'm not excreting water, I have a high level of vasopressin. If I'm not conserving water, I have a low level of vasopressin. Vasopressin, anti-diuretic hormone. My patient's not diuresing. He's had a head injury. He appears volume overloaded. His serum sodium is low. His serum osm is low. When I look at his urine, his urine sodium is high. It's not about sodium. It's really about water. He has an inability to excrete water, and I'm going to call that SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate anti-diuretic hormone. Why are you not making urine? You should be. You're diluting your serum and concentrating in your urine. Okay, well, that sounds like a lot of things, doesn't it? Sounds like heart failure. Sounds like renal failure. So it's a little bit harder, except we're looking at it in the context of a head injury. Typically, patients present first with DI, then SIADH, and then DI again. So it's usually in a tricyclic presentation, DI, SIADH, DI, until things get more regulated. Okay. DI, inability to conserve water, deficiency, deficiency of vasopressin. SIADH, inability to excrete water, excessive vasopressin. And typically that intermediate part, that SIADH is because we're replacing your vasopressin and we're trying to figure out the right replacement. Because all of a sudden you're, you don't just all of a sudden start producing and releasing vasopressins because we're treating you. So we're trying to figure out how to best do that when we're administering vasopressin to your patient. Okay. Yes. So in DI, what's the serum? Okay, start with the first thing. In DI, you cannot conserve water. So what happens to your serum sodium? It's concentrated. It's concentrated. So that means serum sodium has gone and serum osm has gone. Okay, good. When I look at your urine, your urine is dilute because you're making too much urine, okay? SIADH, inability to excrete water. Serum sodium goes, serum osm goes. Okay, good. And because when I look at your urine, even though it's not really about your, sodium always follows water, but even though it's not really about your sodium, I'm gonna see that the sodium concentration in the urine is pretty high because you're not actually releasing water, diluting out your, your urine sodium. When are you gonna suspect DI or SIADH? Always neurologically. There are some types of lung cancers that actually will present with SIADH, not DI, but SIADH. And those are, you know, they used to always ask this question. I don't think they do it anymore. Uh, oat cell carcinoma of the lung actually will present with a uh, syndrome of SIADH. Now I can draw your vasopressin level and say, look, your, your level is high, your level is low. That's one thing. The other thing is I can just give you some vasopressin, see how you respond. I can give you water, see how you respond, right? If you have DI and I give you water, you're gonna waste that water immediately. That's, that's given me some good information. So uh, on my YouTube channel, I have an hour presentation on DI SIADH and something else called cerebral salt wasting, which is not really about your cerebral cells, but about uh, uh, alteration in the osmo receptors. Uh, they're not going to ask you that because your clinicians aren't actually looking at that very effectively. See, uh, cerebral salt wasting looks a lot like DI, but it also looks like it has SIADH. It's very confounding. It is something you want to be aware of. It's not going to be on your exam.
the INS IAVH, there are usually some questions about them because we see it pretty commonly in the ICU patient in trauma ICU and of course um, in neuro ICU. We see it pretty, not infrequently. Does it have to be uh, injuries with seven months of brain like a pituitary gland or a GI system? So, uh, I'm sorry, say that again. Does it have to be injuries with seven months of brain like a pituitary gland? It has to, uh, it does not have to be, thank you for that question. So the question is, does it have to be a direct, so let's say it this way, a direct injury to the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland? Hypothalamus makes vasopressin, pituitary gland releases it. So does it have to be a direct injury to the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland? Does not have to be a direct injury. It can be a secondary injury. Secondary injury is when you have brain edema, and you're putting pressure down on the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So I haven't actually injured the hypothalamus or the pituitary, but the brain swelling is compressing that area and I can see DIRS, IADH. So that's a really great question because if you, know, if you have a direct injury to your hypothalamus or your pituitary, that's gonna be pretty darn significant. Uh, so, you know, we always hope it's a secondary injury. And, and once we relieve your cerebral edema, that should get better. Okay, so, um, okay, last thing I'm gonna just mention here, and I don't think she had a discussion about it. Sometimes there's a question on it. Again, pretty straightforward. There's a syndrome called locked-in syndrome. Locked-in syndrome is basically, it's an injury that basically separates. It's not really a spinal cord injury. It's usually a bleed. It's frequently a basilar bleed at the base of the brain um, and you know, can occur in the circle of Willis a basilar bleed, circle of Willis. And again, you know, I'm, I'm just really trying to direct you to salient points. I'm not, I'm not a neurospecialist. Um, that, that bleed itself basically separates really at the pons. So remember how your, your cortex and your cerebellar uh, surfaces are connected to the spinal cord through that midbrain, right? The pons and the, uh, the midbrain, the pons and the medulla. So this is a bleed typically that involves the pons. So I want you to think about it, it's not real. I want you to think about it like you've transected at the pons. Everything from the pons and above is functional. Everything, everything sensory motor, everything from pons and below is non-functional. Why do we call it locked in? Right, this is not a spinal cord injury. This is typically a hemorrhagic injury and you are, and you can't talk, that's the thing. So, sorry, your pons is gonna control your ability here. So you can't talk. So actually, I should say, and perhaps I said it incorrectly, typically the nose and above is maintained and the nose and below is not maintained. So your patient can blink their eyes, they are 100% cognitive, but they cannot communicate and they cannot move. They cannot speak. They are locked inside of their cerebral cortex. Right, exactly. Which is why they ask a question about it because they're not asking you to be neurospecialist, but want you to recognize how significant that is, that locked in syndrome. So, you know, Lots of times I, I think about um, when I was young, you know, there was a Twilight Zone series. Twilight Zone was like really remarkable. When I was young, it was like, oh, on television, there's this series that talks about all these bizarre things. And then just recently, you might remember, was it Brazil or Venezuela where a woman, they were at her funeral and she opened up her eyes. They thought she was dead and they 
you know, they must not have done a very good evaluation or maybe something else, I don't know. But it always makes me think it's locked-in syndrome because locked-in syndrome can appear like your patient is not alive. And they may not always, and especially when it first occurs, be able to open their eyes. So uh, on the twilight zone, that's, that's what I say now when I look back at, oh, that was a patient with locked-in syndrome. Locked-in syndrome just means your cerebral cortex bilaterally is intact, but you can only respond from the nose and above. You are locked inside your skull. The who you are, everything that you know, that you wanna say, that you, you need to communicate is locked inside your brain, typically from a pontine bleed. Pardon me? Oh, it's, it's from a, a posterior bleed, pontine bleed. So I like to remind everybody is the simplest way. And again, I'm just trying to make it simple, right? I'm, I, I, I'm gonna again say I'm not a neurospecialist, but I wanna make things simple. I think it's really important for us to understand circulation. The circle of Willis in the brain, I want you to think about the circle of Willis like 285, okay? It's a bypass mode. That's what circle of Willis is, is a bypass vessel. Exiting from that and entering into it is 75 north and south, 85 north and south, and 20 east and west. Circle of Willis, 75 north and south, 85 north and south, 20 east and west. Whenever you have occlusion, you're gonna increase the traffic through the circle of Willis. Just like if there's a block on 75 and it's close to 285, we're gonna increase the traffic on 285. That's really important for us to understand. The circle of Willis, especially in the posterior circulation is a place that often will present with an aneurysm, either in the anterior, it's called the anterior communicator and the posterior communicator. So just think about that when you're, when you're considering. So on the right side from the circle of Willis, 75 north, 85 south, 20 west. On your right side, 85 north, 20 east, 75 south. Visualize it like 285. Of course, it's like this in the brain, but you're gonna visualize it like this. 75 north and south, 85 north and south, 20 east and west. Anterior, posterior, middle. Anterior, right and left. Posterior, right and left. Middle, right and left. And those are the vessels we plebes in neuro to pass an exam, to have a good working knowledge. That's what we have to understand. We don't have to understand all of the other smaller vessels like the, probably uh, Kim Kelly, Molly, Courtney, they can list all the vessels. We don't have to know that. We have to understand basically. Anterior supplies an anterior, middle supplies middle, post, posterior supplies posterior, right? So anterior circulation is the anterior frontal lobes. Middle cerebral circulation supplies the middle or the back of the frontal lobes where the motor cortex is. That's why that's so important. And it's the most common stroke is an MCA stroke. And then the posterior supplies the back part of the brain. So the occipital lobe, et cetera. So you, it, it is really important for us to kind of appreciate those relationships and to try to coordinate that when you're thinking about if it's an anterior cerebral bleed or an anterior stroke, you're gonna have loss of anterior functions. And at the motor strip and at the connection of the motor strip to the temporal lobe, there are gonna be two specific storage areas 
usually on the dominant side of the brain. The dominant side of the brain is the opposite side of the brain from what my handedness, that's what we generally say, my handedness is. So if I am right-handed, I am typically considered to be left dominant, opposite side. Good, everybody good with that. Everybody knows that, right? If I'm right-handed, I'm considered left dominant. In the left dominant area, behind the motor strip, or down at the connection between the frontal and the temporal lobe, there are gonna be two specific storage areas. One of them is motor speech, and the other is acoustic, meaning understanding what I hear. Motor speech is known as broca. Acoustic, understanding what you hear is known as Wernicke. And by the way, they are both fed by tributaries from the middle cerebral artery. So just like when we talk about cardiac cath and we talk about proximal and distal lesions, we talk about stroke, we talk about proximal and distal lesions. The more proximal the lesion, more proximal means the closer to the primary vessel, which bifurcates to anterior and middle. The more likely it is that I'm gonna lose Broca and Wernicke. And by the way, by the way, better lose, from my point of view, better lose both than to lose one. Because if I understand everything you're saying, but I can't say anything back to you, it's incredibly frustrating. If I can't, understand anything you're saying, but I can communicate. It's incredibly frustrating. It's like being made deaf and blind in a second. Broca is motor speech. It would be a proximal middle cerebral arterial uh, stroke, most particularly a stroke. So here's my middle cerebral artery. So I'm, I'm, I'm coming, okay. So looking down at my fist, this is the primary carotid artery, internal carotid artery, which then splits into anterior and middle, okay? Here's anterior going to the front, middle going to the middle. If my lesion is proximal, which means proximal to the internal carotid artery, if it's proximal, I'm gonna have much more loss than if it's distal because then I'm, I've still got blood flow to other areas. I may have to develop some collateral circulation, just like when we talk about cardiology, it's exactly the same kind of vascular issues that occur. I mean, it just makes sense. If, if I have an occlusion at the beginning of the vessel, I'm gonna have a much larger surface area involved, okay? So um, I wanted to highlight those couple of things. We now are at 10 o'clock. So, I wanted to highlight those. Um, I would really encourage you because DI and SIADH are, are oftentimes big questions. Uh, just if you have the time to go to the YouTube channel, search DI SIADH and listen to that. It also includes cerebral salt wasting, which I feel for your clinical practice, you should be very knowledgeable about for your exam. They're not gonna be questions about CSW because most of our providers are not really looking at that except in neuro where they're actually saying, yep, looks like DI and SIADH with cerebral salt wasting. But mostly uh, if we're in, if we're not, if we haven't involved a neurologist, and this really is the neurologist, not the neurosurgeon, in a patient who's in trauma or a patient who's in SI or MI, we didn't invite a neurologist to help us with evaluation of the patient. Everybody's just gonna be confounded. They're trying to figure out what's wrong and it doesn't meet criteria, full criteria for either one. So that I think if, if you have the time, and you're okay with that. Just take a look at that on the YouTube channel. And uh, I'm going to close today and say, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Unless there's some more questions or there's questions from the peanut gallery, all the folks that are online. Um, yes. You know, I would tell you that's not really my area of expertise. So the question is, can I go over brain death testing? But I'll tell you what I will do is before I speak to you next, I will review our criteria for brain death. Okay, so 
Are you asking about Grady's criteria for brain death or what is brain death? Oculocephalic failure. So brain death testing means, so again, you know, I'm, I'm gonna answer, so the question is brain death. So I'm gonna answer this as simply as I can, okay? When you are born, you're a brand new baby, two minutes out of the womb, you suck, you swallow, you have eye reflexes, and you have a gag reflex. You have reflexes. As you are developing, you are connecting reflexiveness to control in the cerebral cortex, okay? In order for me to say that your brain is alive, you must still have reflex. When you lose your reflexes, so if I put cold, so this is what I think you're asking. So if I put cold solution in your left ear, your left eye should go, hey, what's that over there? The eye should deviate to the left and stay there because something happened in my ear canal. If I have loss of that reflex, the eye doesn't transition in the, in the eyes of the CCRN exam. The eye doesn't move to that side. Now, in reality, in real brain death testing, frequently you'll have nystagmus that you'll have an alerted response, but it's not an appropriate reflex. The other appropriate reflex is that when we turn the head to the side, your eye should go in the opposite direction. What? Your eye should go in that direction, the opposite direction of your head turn. That's a positive reflex. If I turn your head and your eyes stay straight with your head, you're like a very old fashioned, not the dolls they have now, a very old fashioned doll that's eyes were painted on the head. So when you turn the head, the eyes went with the head. That's why they call that doll's eyes. So the doll, so you have a doll eye? No. No, it's, this is named historically for dolls that had their eyes painted on so that when your head turned, your eyes went with your head, okay? What we prefer to have, what we want you to have is we want your eyes to go to the opposite direction because you're like, why are you turning my head? Danger, 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 something's over there turning my head. That's your reflex. So I don't like to use positive or negative. I like to say reflex present, reflex absent. Your eye doesn't look to the ear where I've instilled cold solution, reflex absent. Your eyes go with your head when your head turns. So it's right when you turn your head, your eye should go to the opposite direction. If that doesn't happen, then the reflex is absent. And it's better to say absent because when people say positive or negative, you're like, well, does that mean you do have it or you don't have it? I don't know what that means. So I like to clarify reflex present, reflex absent. So what are they They're looking at two different cranial nerves and reflexive cranial nerves. They're two different nerves that control these things. But uh, in terms of brain death testing, you may test, you may see that you test only one. And, and then there's other things that we do that are really important. But I do want to be aware it's 10 minutes after 10. So I've got some folks that have had to go off the phone and I see you need to go. So I, 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 I want to be sure when we, when we come back next week, I want to talk about the most important component of brain death testing because a lot of this is subjective when we're turning the head and doing all these other things. And remember, there's a lot of things between present and absent that might include nystagmus and other things. So I wanna talk about what is your response to increasing carbon dioxide? That's really the best brain death test. That's probably the most significant and the least subjective, okay? So I will talk about that and I can incorporate that and in next time I'm gonna talk about pulmonary. All right, my friends, I'm gonna discharge everybody because I don't wanna keep you longer. Thank you very much for attending today. Um, I think we were really lucky, really lucky to have Courtney, and I hope that my explanations have shed some light and not a conflict. All right, my friends, thank you very, very, very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.